was younger, 17, I lived in a small village of like 1,200 people. Usually every year there's this local town festival and all the adults go out for dinner and party at the town hall where they perform some acting and make fun of the year that just passed. Usually this is in February so it's snowy and dark pretty early. And when this festival is on there are absolutely all 13 to 17 year old girls booked for babysitting. But me and my two friends... We went for a drive around the town since you have to be 18 to go to the party, so we just sort of drove around giving people lifts to the party and earned some extra cash. Since there's no taxi in town, this was a great way to get some extra pocket money, I guess. But we'd been driving for maybe a couple of hours now, and of course we knew where everyone lived, and some of the adults asked us to drive past their house to make sure everything is alright and give the parents some extra comfort. I think it was also to give us some tasking until the party was over so they could get a lift home. But in one of the older neighborhoods in the town there were these low floodlights. We would just drive slowly and one mum who we gave a lift earlier lived there. She was a widow with three young children, two, four and eight, if I recall correctly. And her niece was babysitting and she was 15. The time must have been around 10pm I would guess and... When we drove in this neighborhood, which is surrounded by hills and some cliffs, my friend swore that he saw something move in her garden. We didn't think much of it, and just sort of said that it was probably a cat or something. We kept driving to the other end of town, but my friend in the back seat said that he just had a bad feeling and wanted to drive back to a house to check if we could see some footprints in the snow or anything like that. We turned around and when we got back there, we parked the car and looked over the fence and yeah, there were fairly new human footprints in the snow, adult size. So we all just sort of looked at each other and decided to follow the trail. The trail went past all the bedrooms, but near every window, the footprint turned to the window like someone was trying to peek in and eventually the trail ended on the street and we lost it there where the snowplow had been earlier in the night. We chatted whether or not if we should go and get the mum from the party or ring the doorbell to check if everything was alright. Since none of the tracks led to the back door or the front door, we decided that two of us would stay in the neighbourhood, sort of hidden, and monitor the house, and the driver would drive to the police station and pick up the mum on the way back. And that was a very good call. Maybe five minutes after he left, we saw someone lurking behind one of the garage couple houses down the road and he wasn't moving, just sort of sat there with a cigarette. We monitor from a distance since he couldn't see us. Then he stood up, looked around and started to creep to the house where the mum lived and then he walked to the back door. Without thinking, me and my friend ran through the two gardens that were between where we were and the mum's house was so we could watch him trying to enter the back door. We arrived just in time, he was trying to open the door when we shouted at him, what are you doing, and he made a run for it and we followed. He ran down the street to get some speed ahead of us I think, but we were both pretty athletic so we were gaining on him. I must admit too that this was the most intense moment of my life ever and I remember the only thing that I was thinking was not to slip and lose momentum. The end of the street was approaching though and the next turn would be 90 degrees to the right so instead of slowing down I jumped off the street so that I could intercept him after he would lose speed by taking the turn. Well, my calculation was dead wrong though and he managed to take the turn without losing much speed. I spent too much energy sprinting in the snow and I knew that I would have to slow down at this point. I was still about 10 meters behind him but my friend was closer and gaining on him. And when my friend realized that he could kick his feet and trip him, he did. He fell and this was the quickest takedown ever. Smashed his head to the frozen ground and he was just completely out, just like that. While we were catching our breath, he didn't move. We rolled him over on his back and he was breathing but really shallow with a sort of crackling noise. I was terrified. Millions of questions came to my head, like, is he dying? What if this was just some relative making a prank? Why did we even chase him? Meanwhile, my friend checked his pockets, and there was a lubricant, strong sedatives, and a broken camera in there. Luckily for us, too, the driver came a couple of minutes after the mum and the police. Then the ambulance arrived, and they took him away. 
The day after, we were brought forth for questioning in the police station, and the chief told us that he was a known pedophile, not from our town apparently, and we for sure saved the day and probably more kids since the tumble that he took when he fell. He got bleeding in the brain and is not even able to wipe his own butt anymore. We told him the story and when my friend said that he tripped him, the chief stopped typing and said, are you sure that you tripped him? The way I see it, you three heroes caught a burglar in the act and while he was running away, he fell and hit his head, right? And looked at us and nodded with a soft smile. Thinking back, this perv must have planned this. Knowing when the festival was, knowing that she was a single mum, picking at the house, knowing where and when and exactly what to do. And knowing that really gives me the creeps. So this situation happened maybe about a year ago now. It's important to note that I'm also a girl, so this was a very scary and potentially dangerous situation for both of us. So one night after work, just after it had become dark, my girlfriend stopped at the Walmart neighborhood market down the road, which by the way is next to a big highway or interstate. I made a last minute run to the bank, and right as I'm pulling out of the bank, I get a text from her about thinking that she's being followed. I asked her for more details and also told her not to leave the store and that I was going to drive up to the front door and either watch her get to her car or have her get in mine if she needed. She told me that there were two men that she kept seeing in every single aisle, usually behind her. They were very clearly staring at her each time and watching her very closely. She thought that she was just being paranoid, but I told her to trust her gut and that she should let a worker know about the situation and even call the police because it wasn't worth the risk. Before I had made it all the way there though, she texted me that she was in the checkout. She said that the guys followed her there and went to a self-checkout near her but with no items. They quickly grabbed some gum from the shelf and put it into a Walmart sack but they just sort of stood there, taking forever to cash that item out and kept watching her and waiting for her to finish. I told her to check out as slowly as humanly possible, and I finally arrived there. She had just texted me that they finally took their bag and exited the store. However, right as I pulled up, I saw two guys that perfectly matched her description of them, hiding in a little cutout near the entrance. They were just standing there and kept peeking around the corner at the front door every single time someone exited, and I knew that they were looking for her. I pulled my car forward right in front of them and literally rolled my window down and just stared into their souls. I didn't look away and I wanted to make sure that even though they didn't know that I had anything to do with her, that I got a very, very good look at their faces and was watching them. I texted her and told her not to return to her car. I told her to get straight into mine and right then they started walking off. However... They had to have been following her since she arrived because the next thing they did was walk straight to her car. Her car is very unique and stands out. They dropped the bag with the gum in it on the ground on the way to her car and one of them went between her car and the one next to it squatted down by the trunk and just stayed there. The next one walked over to a white work van with painted windows and no license plate. He spoke to someone that was in the driver's seat while this was happening, one of the cars next to hers left and they then pulled the van up into that spot. Upon seeing this, I obviously called her and told her to go straight to my car and don't even look at hers as they were waiting for her with a van. She comes out with groceries and they see her and squat down and we quickly load them up and she gets in my car. The man stood up and walked to the van and I pull away and try to go around the van to catch a license plate number. And of course, that's when I noticed that there was none. I drove in a totally different direction from home and we drove around for a while. I wanted to make sure that nobody was following us, of course, and also to give them time to leave her car alone. I wanted to call the cops, but she was convinced that we were just seeing things that weren't there. Like taking coincidences and making them into something. Obviously, looking back... After having talked in depth about both of our experiences and things witnessed, 
We definitely should have called the cops, and I really regret not doing it. And I have since seen that van with the same two guys driving, back in the neighborhoods behind the Walmart too. I was turning onto the street that they were turning off of, still no license plate, but their van had more things on the exterior to make it look like a work van. Things like a ladder on the roof and stuff like that. I got so creeped out that I quickly tried to get away just in case they turned around and tried to come for me. And so I just floored at home. Again, I thought about calling the police, but I mean, what would I say at this point? Yeah, there's two men driving away from a neighborhood with a work van. Go and get them. They don't even take most things seriously, even when it results in something actually happening here. I just truly really hope that there's a valid explanation for all of these actions and that I just came to a conclusion that was not the case and was just being dramatic. But, I don't know. Like, maybe they waited at the front because they didn't see their buddy with the van and thought that he might be inside the Walmart and were just watching for him. Her car is very cool, so maybe they just looked at it and... I don't know. Maybe they just wanted to steal parts off of a car or something. Maybe there's an explanation, but probably not right. It doesn't explain them following her or getting gum in a bag just to drop it in the parking lot. Anyway, luckily I haven't heard of any kidnappings coming out of Walmart, but who knows. I haven't been digging for it or anything, but I do know that I'm extra cautious now and try not to go out past dark. I also scan the parking lot for the van before I go in, but normally I just do the curbside pickup now. My girlfriend, she does the same thing. When I was 14 years old, I went to a church gathering on a Halloween night that was called Hallelujah Night. It was a Christian alternative to Halloween. My family and I would get there in the afternoon since we'd volunteer to help set up the booths, the cakewalk, candy barrels, all that sort of stuff. But I was mostly there to just get first dibs on all of the candy, if I'm being honest. After I finished helping with the usual booth that I helped set up, I took a seat on a bench near the main sanctuary. It was my favorite place to sit at since I could see the entire lot and, most of all, the beautiful sunset. I pulled out my PSP at the time and was scrolling through some music that I had on it when some guy approached me and started a conversation. I've never been a people person though, so usually when things like this happen, I just keep the conversation short. However, this guy had this weird type of warmth to him as if he was a friend of mine. As the conversation carried on too, I started to ask him if he was new because I hadn't seen him before. He told me that he had been going to this church for years, but left after an incident happened. When I asked him about the incident, he paused, looked at me and said that there's some things people pick up on that they know aren't normal. Also, that you should never get curious about things that you know you should leave alone. I had a sort of confused look on my face, as you can imagine, since I didn't know what he meant at that time. The guy noticed it and said that I would understand once I got older. I looked down at my PSP that I had in my hand still and looked back up and when I did the guy was just gone. I looked around and I couldn't find him anywhere in the lot except for a few people still prepping for hallelujah night and it just didn't make any sense. Fast forward to a few months later and I was sitting in the main sanctuary before leaving to do my usual volunteer work on the upper floor. The upper floor was a daycare area for kids, so at the end of the service, volunteers would escort the children downstairs and I would go into each room, shutting off the lights and making sure no children were still up there. And I'll never forget getting up to leave to do my usual duties when the pastor started tacking about an upcoming funeral or something. I looked at the big screens on each side of the main sanctuary and the face of that man that I was talking to during Hallelujah Night was right there on the screen. I couldn't believe what I was seeing to be honest. To this day it still seems unreal as well. I was beyond shook as I made my way out of the main sanctuary and to the flights of the big stairs as I went to the upper floor. 
Once I made it to the upper floor, another volunteer had confirmed that all the children were escorted downstairs, and she noticed that I had looked sort of pale from seeing what I saw in the main sanctuary, and asked me if I was okay. I told her that it was nothing and proceeded to cut off all the lights on the upper floor as she left downstairs. The upper floor was like a giant hallway with doors on each side and a door at the end of the hallway with a giant window in it. When I came to the last room at the end of the hall, I would always leave the blinds on that big window open since the light always illuminated the dark hallway and made me feel less scared. But as I left the room, I just remember feeling panic. It started to get freezing and I felt like if I left that room, something was waiting for me in the darkened rooms that were going to jump out and attack me. And as I'm trying to muster up the courage to just run for it, I see a small head of a child peek out of a couple of doors down. It stayed there for a few seconds too and then it put its head back in the room. I immediately called out to the child but there was no answer. And the fear that I had maybe a minute ago was now gone as I left the last room to go through the illuminated hallway. I made it to the other room in a matter of seconds, cutting on the lights and searching the entire room for the kid that I saw, but there was no one there. I started getting spooked again as I cut off the lights in that room and then one of the most terrifying things that I've ever seen and experienced happened. As I was leaving the room, I looked back at the last room's window, which illuminated the hallway, and out of nowhere, there was this massive black mass moved in front of the window, almost covering the light completely. It was darker than black, and its outline as it covered the light seemed to be moving almost. It was enough to scare me to run for my life, and I ran the rest of the hallway and down the stairs. I was stopped by one of the ushers who told me not to run, but... When I told him what I saw, he looked at me as if I was crazy. Once church was over, I told my parents about what happened on the ride home and they ended up not believing me since, well, they're skeptics. But I know what I saw that day and it's something that it still terrifies me to this very day. This happened back when I was 14, but even with my bad memory, I remember this years later. I honestly think that this memory is going to haunt me for the rest of my life, in fact. So, I would often go walking either alone or with my neighbor Jem, but this specific night she didn't go with me. I usually went walking around 9 at night, but was impatient that night, so I left about 15 minutes early. It was summer in Texas, but I grabbed my black hoodie anyway. The reason for this was because I was a pretty small kid, even for my age, and I would walk with a knife in my sleeve in case of a problem. There was security in this area, but they were pretty much useless and weren't fond of the kids anyway. So the black hoodie was to avoid them seeing me and to maybe help avoid being noticed by anyone else too. But the area was heavily wooded, and the roads had no street lights, mind you. I had lived there my whole life, though, so with the moonlight, this wasn't really an issue. I could see things as much as I needed to to get around. So I walked to the park in the area and sat down on the swing set like I had a million times before. The park was old and wasn't very well taken care of, so the swing set creaked and the wooden picnic tables were half rotted with the paint mostly peeled away, and the metal slide was covered in rust. There was the main road that ran in front of the park and a branch off road that ran along the side of the park. There was sort of a thin line of trees between the side road and the park too. After a while a favourite song of mine came on and I of course started singing it since singing was a big way that I let out stress despite my stage fright. But I had a tendency to not hold back when swinging at this park since there was rarely people near it during the day, let alone at night. But my blood ran cold when I saw the shape of a person maybe 50 to 100 feet in front of me on the main road. The main reason for the chill too was the fear that this random person actually heard me sing, but then I... I got a deeper and worse feeling. Something was just wrong about them. I noticed that the person was walking fast, 
like really fast, almost running speed in fact. I figured that he might have been running from something or after something, but when I looked around everywhere that I could possibly see from where I was, I saw nothing else but them. They soon passed by the park not seeming to notice me and after a few minutes of waiting to make sure that they were gone I continued singing. After a couple of more songs I decided that it was time to go home. I still had that bad feeling of course, that uneasy pit in my stomach that you get when you're being watched. I even thought that I saw something behind the tree line between the side road and the swings but I brushed that off as an animal or something. The deer were really common here, so were dogs and things so it was probably me just getting spooked by an animal again. But the feeling just was eating away at me. So I cut my usual 30 minutes to an hour walk to about 10 minutes. I got up and started to leave the park, turning onto the main road to go home. Now, as I'm leaving, I saw a person walking towards the main road from the road that ran right along the park. It looked like the same person as before too, and it was definitely a man. He must have been visiting a friend or something, right? Even if that was the case, I crossed to the opposite side of the street so that I wouldn't pass directly by him. He didn't look particularly dangerous or unusual or anything, so sadly no weird, creepy, homeless looking man for this story. I just got a bad feeling from him, I guess. Which is probably what makes him even more terrifying, I suppose. He got to the intersection in any case before me and he stopped. I passed by and glanced at the man taking in what details that I could under the moonlight that came from between the tree branches and for all intents and purposes he looked normal. He was probably an average height wearing a pure white ball cap with no logos that casted a shadow over his face and a pure white polo type shirt too. Strangely too there wasn't a speck of dirt on this guy. He looked well kept and made the moonlight almost shine on him like some kind of ghost which just added to my uneasy feeling. He watched me as I passed by and I tried to pretend that I didn't notice. I would occasionally look around as if I was just looking at the woods so I could see the man out of my peripheral vision. I didn't want or need to see the man in detail, partly because I was scared of the possibility of seeing something else too. Uh, just because the man was much larger than me didn't mean that he wasn't probably armed too. In any case, once I was around 15 feet past the intersection, I did one of those glances and my stomach dropped as I saw him turn and start to follow me. Maybe he was just going for an extra long walk or something, right? He probably isn't following me, right? Then another thought popped into my mind and it sent my stomach to my feet. I'd been there for probably 10 minutes or so, singing after he passed. But what if he wasn't visiting anyone? But what if he was the thing that I saw just beyond the tree line? Now that's kind of obvious now that that was almost definitely the case, but let's be fair. When do 14 year olds ever think through all the details of a situation completely during the situation? He was probably watching me the whole time, thinking back on it, and he could have snuck up and done who knows what at any time. I kept doing my glances though and noticed that he was getting closer and closer. I gripped my knife tighter, ready in case I had to use it. The chance of it going well wasn't the best, but it was a better chance than not trying at all. But obviously, I wanted that to be a last ditch option. I tried to make sure that it wasn't obvious, that I was keeping tabs on him that is. I didn't want him to get anxious and have him decide to speed up whatever his plan was. I was only halfway home and this was before I had surgery on my ankle too, so I was absolutely sure that he would catch me before I would reach my house if I started running where I was. So that wasn't an option whatsoever. I didn't have any current options though, so the one that I chose was just to bide my time until an opportunity opened up. I kept walking at a rather quick but unpanicked pace, keeping tabs on the man as he inched closer and kept an eye out for opportunities. And an opportunity came and it felt like it was sent from God himself. I saw headlights. A car was rolling towards me at a careful pace, which was normal considering the animals that I mentioned earlier. And 
It was Jem's dad. I recognized the shape of the lights, and as the car got closer, I became convinced that it was him. I was never so relieved to see that tiny white car ever, and I tried signaling him without letting the man know I was, but he just passed by. He must have thought that I was just saying hi, I suppose, in retrospect, but I glanced back again, and even though he didn't stop, he did exactly what I needed him to do. He slowed down a bit as he passed, and the man backed up a lot and crossed to the other side of the road. The headlights were on him, and he couldn't see me, at least for around five or six seconds, but maybe a bit longer, including readjusting to the dark. Either way, I walked faster, and I didn't run, that way my steps wouldn't be too loud, but I ran to the corner before he'd be able to readjust and get sight of me again. And once I could turn and no longer see him, I quickly rushed home, and I locked the door. I knew better than to leave it unlocked, since, after all, I lived in the woods. Just because I couldn't see him anymore, too, didn't mean that he wasn't nearby, and didn't mean that he couldn't see me. And, as stupid as this next part is, it's probably for the best that I did it. I texted Jem, and I asked her to meet me outside right now because something happened and I needed to come over. She said okay, and we both went outside, and as soon as I saw her in her driveway, I sprinted to her house. I didn't want to be outside any longer than I had to be. She kept panicking and asked what happened and what was wrong, and once I caught my breath, I told her everything. And right after I got done explaining, her dad walked in the house. He looked at Jem, seeming worried, and then noticed me hiding behind her. He looked relieved and told her that I was about to tell you to ask her to come over here, and I asked him if he saw the man following me, and he said that he did. He didn't really see his face, but that he was trying to make it look like he was on the phone, apparently, when he wasn't holding anything at all. But... That wasn't even close to the worst part. I think that this was the first time that I've ever seen this man scared, and I'm not sure I've ever seen fear like this from him since. He told us that the man apparently wasn't alone. You see, there's a gate at the front of where I lived that needed a card to get in, and apparently there was another man outside that gate, who looked similar to the first, standing by a van. That meant that they didn't live there, didn't want security knowing that they were there, and wanted to get out quickly and quietly after they did whatever they were there for. Needless to say, I spent the night at Jem's that night, and I have no clue what would have happened had Jem's dad not driven by, or if I would have left at my normal time that night. From 2013 to 2019, I worked in an outdoor education at many different summer camps and outdoor education centers too in Canada, mostly Ontario, but I did spend a season in the Rocky Mountains too. Having grown up going to sleepaway camp and eventually participating in month-long leadership programs with backcountry canoeing components and whatnot, I was well prepared to lead a group of teen girls from a camp in Georgian Bay on a two-week camping trip in the Tamagami region during my first year as a counsellor. The region is located between North Bay Subdury and Timmins, Ontario. This region is home to many provincial parks, wonderful hiking and even canoeing routes, and the Bear Island Indian Reserve too. Our route was fairly typical and began at the Whitefish Falls region, ending at Highway 11 after 14 days of paddling, hiking and campfire making. We had a satellite phone to check in with our camp director every day and in case of an emergency too. We also had multiple exit points along the route. Now, until our second to last night, we were honestly having fun and it was a relatively uneventful time. Besides some mild dehydration and the usual bumps and bruises that is. But near the end of our trip, we were doing some free camping on the shore of an uninhabited island in Bear Lake that is recognized as a part of Bear Island Indian Reserve. It's a beautiful area and we were across from the main island that the majority of the 250 person population inhabits. We had put out the fire and had gone to bed when I would guess uh, about maybe an hour after falling asleep I was jarred awake by the sound of a, a loud motorboat. 
Obviously, this isn't that weird because it's a large lake and many people use boats to reach the mainland or their homes on secluded islands. However, it was around 11pm now and things have been quiet for the last few hours. The motor then cut out and I could clearly hear the sounds of an argument. It sounded like at least one man and a woman and they were very angry and yelling at each other although I couldn't hear anything specific because they were too far from shore. When suddenly, the woman screamed and I heard a splash into the water and then just complete silence. At this point, I was pretty freaked out and hoping that my girls hadn't woken up, but I wasn't that lucky because I could immediately hear talking from their tent and could tell that they were pretty scared. I was about to unzip my door and look out to see if Maybe the boaters had had an accident or something when all of a sudden my whole tent lit up. The light slowly panned across me and onto the tent my girls were in. That immediately made them quiet. In a normal volume though, I was able to tell them to stay absolutely still. The light panned back to my tent and then over to theirs again. I can only guess that it must have been some sort of a boat with a searchlight on it. If anyone has any ideas of what type of boat it could have been, please do let me know too. But after an eternity that was really only about five minutes, the light was turned off and I heard the motor engage and fade as the boat drove away from us. I immediately found the satellite phone and I called our camp director who gave us the phone number for the local police. I called them and they said that they would forward the information that I gave to the local native detachment on Bear Island. I don't think any of us slept that night and I got up at 5 in the morning to take my canoe out and take a look around. I thought that maybe somebody had fallen overboard and had managed to swim to shore or something. Obviously I didn't find anyone but there was nothing floating in the water either. Although it was a pretty deep body of water I'll admit. But after that none of us wanted to camp one more night there so I called the camp and had them head out to pick up point a, a day early. And boy, did we paddle quickly that day and didn't really talk much. I think that none of us really wanted to speculate about what we might have heard and what could have happened if we'd made a noise or moved when the light was on our tents that night. I've also thought about this uh, a lot over the years, but whenever I've told people the story, they've always been quite skeptical. I also recently started looking into missing person cases in the area, but uh, not with much luck. If anyone is listening to this though and is familiar with indigenous issues in Canada, they would know that there is a bit of an epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women and these cases usually go unreported or unsolved. This event took place quite a few years ago now, so unfortunately I don't really remember everything that happened, but I do remember nearly all of it. Anyway, this happened when I was around four or five years old and on an Easter Sunday. My family always gathers together at my grandmother's house to celebrate holidays, birthdays, etc. So as we do every holiday, my mother and I started our long hour trip to her house. My mother prefers to live away from all the city commotion, which explains the long drive. But we were probably around uh, maybe 20 minutes away from our destination when my mum noticed that we were a little low on gas, so we pulled into this sort of old, almost rustic looking gas station with just a handful of customers inside. It was red and white with a few festive decorations outside, and lots of Easter stickers on the two large glass windows that were on either side of the door. My mum, having taught me not to talk to strangers, nor open the car doors for anyone but her, trusted me enough to leave me in the car alone as she went inside briefly to pay for the gas. She told me that she'd be right back before going into the gas station. It felt nice that day too, so the windows in the car were down so that we could feel the breeze while driving instead of the AC. While I was waiting on my mum, I remember adjusting the colourful paper clippings in my Easter basket next to me then looking out of the backseat window. When I looked over, I saw a, a tall, older man, maybe around 30 or 40 years old if I have to guess, approaching my window. He crouched down slightly and looked at me. 
Hi there, what's your name? I remember him saying that. At this moment, I remembered that I wasn't supposed to talk to strangers, so I told the man that my mum says that I shouldn't speak to strangers. He then replied with, well, we can be friends then. My name's Charlie, and now that you know, I guess I'm not a stranger, huh? At the time, I thought that he was right. In my mind, I thought, since a stranger is someone that you don't know, this man wasn't a stranger anymore because I knew his name. The man and I had a short conversation that I, I don't quite remember. All I do remember is that he told me that I, I had a nice Easter basket, I think. At this point, though, I started to get a really sick feeling in my stomach, but being a kid, of course, I just couldn't tell why. My mum then walked out of the gas station and noticed the man immediately and began approaching the car quickly, asking the man what he thinks that he was doing. The man then seems to panic and he pulls my door handle violently. He quickly realized that it was locked. Thankfully, it proceeded to reach into my window and grab me by one of my wrists and attempt to pull me out. This obviously scared me a lot, causing me to panic and pull against him on instinct, and this caused him to let go and take off running. My mum quickly ran to the car and I unlocked the doors. She grabbed me and pulled me into an almost painful bear hug, then inspected me closely, repeatedly asking if I was okay. I ended up with a bit of a slight bruise, a redness sort of on my arm where he grabbed me, but other than that, I was just pretty much shaken up. The reality of what had just happened, though, set in in that moment, and I remember just crying and holding on to my mum right after I said that I was okay. And after that, I really don't remember that much. But I recently asked my mum about it, and she said that she called the police immediately after it. But to this day, my mum still says that this was the most frightening moment of her life, and claims that if she had gotten there just one moment later, and came back to an empty car, that she just wouldn't have been able to have lived with herself. So I was about 12 years old, living with my mum in a run-down apartment complex. The building that we lived in was the smallest of the three in the complex, and it was shaped like an L, with our apartment being closest to the inside corner on the shorter side of the L. But to our right was another apartment, with another single mother and her son, who was much younger than me. Below us was a family with two kids that I was friends with, and the apartment above was empty. It wasn't the nicest area by any means, so after dark we always kept our windows and doors closed and locked. And the reason that I'm going into so much detail is so that you can understand why I believe that this voice didn't come from anywhere other than in our apartment. We were up late one night, around 11pm I would say, looking at something on her computer. But my mum and I would typically stay up late just hanging out together, so this was completely usual behaviour. The computer was sort of tucked into one of the corners of our dining room, basically just a patch of lino off from the kitchen, and our living room was to our backs. But we didn't have the TV on, nor did we have any other lights on, other than the one in the dining room. I can't remember what we were looking at too, but I do remember this sudden feeling that we were being watched. Many things that I attribute to sort of unexplained paranormal activity happened while we were living in this place, so... While the feeling of being watched was incredibly uncomfortable, it wasn't something out of the ordinary by any means. But as I was beginning to shift my seat to turn around and look, we both heard a sinister male voice say meow. A conversation level, neither a whisper nor a yell, drawn out and sort of really exaggerated, almost sort of a tone, like it was mocking us. I would say that it took two or three seconds before this voice was finished, and in that time I felt every hair on my entire body stand on end. We immediately spun around, me nearly falling out of the chair to the floor, both of us now hyperventilating almost in absolute terror. My mum said something about it, if you aren't good then get out of here, or something to that effect. And I am honestly not sure how I slept that night or any other nights that we were there for, but we never heard anything like that again. Which is probably the weirdest thing about this. It was just totally random, out of the blue, and never happened again. I 
When I was about 16, I needed to get a job. I was out of high school and living with my parents who were driving me insane. I just needed to get out of there and I was applying for jobs everywhere that I could see. I would even walk into a store and just immediately ask if they were hiring. I didn't care where I worked. I just needed the money to get out of my current living situation, stat. The local grocery store was having a mass hire, job fair type deal on a specific day and time and I woke up early, got ready and went. Everyone looking to get a job had to stand in a line and wait to be interviewed. No big deal, I just fumbled with my phone while I waited. The guy in front of me was sort of standing sideways so that he could easily face me and anyone behind me. He continually asked me questions like, is this your first job? How old are you? How far would you have to drive to get to work here? And after that last one, I sort of sarcastically told him that I didn't know he was the person that was supposed to interview me. I thought that he got the point because he stopped talking to me after that. We get up further in the line and finally he's being interviewed in this little office. It was really just a, a setup of tall pieces of cardboard that gave the illusion of privacy during your interview. It was set up right in front of the grocery store so that anyone walking outside could see you during your interview. I was getting nervous because I really wanted this job. When he got done and came out... He said, hope you get the job cutie, I'd love to see you more. He said this as he sort of walked past me. If it weren't for the interview coming up, I probably would have told him to get lost, but anyway. So I get into this makeshift cubicle office. The guy hands me some papers and tells me to fill them out. I do so and hand them back to him when I get done. But when I lifted my head up... I saw behind the man interviewing me was the creep from outside the grocery store watching me during my interview. I was reasonably anxious before, but now I was starting to worry about this creep. I try my best to make it through the interview without looking at him and answer the questions I'm being asked. But occasional glances towards him rewarded me with witnessing this creep groping the glass, having his hand down his pants, hopefully only acting like he was jerking off, and finally taking pictures of me with his phone. And at that moment, I was ready to call the cops as soon as I got out of there if he was still around. But when my interview was wrapping up though, I was given some pamphlets and a, a gift card for a few bucks of groceries, shook hands with the interviewer, etc. But when I looked back at the window, the guy was no longer there, and relief washed over me. I went to leave too, and was praying to God that I didn't mess up the interview. But I walked through the grocery storefront, back to the door that I entered in, and shortly after walking outside, yep, I saw him again, leaning up against the wall. And yes, he saw me too. He was definitely waiting for me there, and I pulled my keys out and put them in between my knuckles like I was taught to do at a young age, and my other hand went straight into my pocket, holding my phone. I started walking towards my car when I passed him and he stepped to walk beside me. So, how'd it go? I said nothing. You know, you're really too cute to be working at a grocery store. You can make a lot more money without even having to leave your house if you just went online. Disgusting, I know, but I still said nothing. Oh, so you're going to be like that, huh? Not saying anything to me. Probably a good idea, in fact, because if you open that damn mouth, I'd be tempted to stick my... I cut him off by swinging around towards him and punching him in the throat with my key fist. Unfortunately, my grip on the keys weren't tight enough and they fell out of my hand on impact, but it was enough to shut him up and get him choking. And at that, I grabbed my keys off the ground and I started running for my car. He was following me and shouting for me, calling me all sorts of names and other vulgarities that I don't remember, but... I got to my car and locked it just in time as he slammed his hands down on my driver's side window. I was shaking like crazy, but I pulled out my phone and after a few feeble attempts from shaking my hands, I correctly dialed 911. He was pounding on my window with open hands, shouting about how I assaulted him, trying to open my doors, walking around the car to see if any of the other doors were unlocked. I tried my best to talk to the dispatcher and tell them where I was. And when he got back to my driver's side door and continued to pound on it and cuss at me, I held my phone up to the window so that he could see the number I dialed and who I was on the phone with. And on that note, 
His face went completely white, and he looked around and just sort of casually walked away. I waited a bit before telling the dispatcher that I think that he was gone. They didn't want to send out a patrol if he had left, but the dispatcher got the description of the guy from me and told me that they would have someone come out and look at the grocery store camera footage, that they would talk to the guy who interviewed me to see if they could find out who the guy was. I never did hear about the guy again, but thankfully, to my knowledge, as this grocery store I frequent, he didn't get the job. Unfortunately, neither did I, though. I live in New York. Recently I went upstate to the Catskill Mountains with my girlfriend, her younger brother, and her mum. They own land there, and my girlfriend's father built a cabin there too. I went there on July 9th and got back to the city on July 12th. Spent three nights in the mountains. During the time that I was there, nothing unusual happened at all. Until the last night, that is. So we swam in a lake nearby, funny enough it's called Crystal Lake, but we also cooked a lot of food and overall just had a really nice time. One night I did vomit after swimming, however other than that nothing strange happened at all. But to give some backstory, the cabin is just great, it has bedrooms and all of that, a kitchen, even a ping pong table. However, it unfortunately doesn't have a shower or a bathroom, so you have to pee in the woods or poop in a bucket and shower with the outdoor shower that they have there. The outdoor shower is pretty much a shower head on a huge metal container. You can adjust the temperature with a dial. It has wooden walls surrounding it for privacy, but the side on the left is completely open to the forest. And basically, you just stand on a wet rock and wet yourself. This was my first time showering outdoors ever, and... I actually really enjoyed it. At times I would just sort of stand under the water and look out into the forest. And every time that I showered it was after 10pm so it was pretty dark. The only light that I had was a lantern and my iPhone flashlight if I decided to use it. However, there was really no need for it since the lantern was pretty strong. But anyway, on the third night, knowing that it would be my last time showering outside for a while, I decided to shower pretty late. My girlfriend was asleep and so was her brother and her mum. It was around 2.13am because I checked my phone before going to shower. I walked to the shower trying to open the door quietly so that I don't wake anyone up. And eventually I get there and I start doing my thing. But I realised about midway through the shower that I had actually forgotten to bring my shampoo. So I decided that I would do what I always did. Just stare out at the forest. It was really beautiful, even though it was dark, because the lantern lit up most of my surroundings. After about, I would say, 15 minutes of just staring out at the forest, I started to become uncomfortable though. And not because of the water temperature or anything like that, just physically uncomfortable. I guess you could say that I, I felt like how I feel when I shut my hallway light and then just sort of run upstairs in the pitch black. This hadn't happened to me at all the whole time that I was here though. All the showers that I took, I never once felt like this. I tried ignoring it, but it eventually just became too much. And as I went to turn off the shower, the feeling completely went away. I decided that I would stay in the shower after all after that, but when I looked back at the forest, I noticed a patch of moss on the tree closest to me. I had noticed it before, which was odd because the tree was closest to me. But even though it was the tree that was closest to me, I still can't see it properly though because I can't get the lantern wet. The lantern just stays at the entrance of the shower stall area, so the tree is still pretty much in the dark. But I focused more on the tree until my eyes sort of got irritated from the water constantly hitting them. I rubbed my eyes and just as I lowered my hands from my face, I saw a figure walking away from in front of the tree. The figure was dark, like a shadow, except it had the moss from the tree all over it. No facial features or anything. Maybe I just couldn't see anything because it was pitch black out there. But when this happened, I walked backwards and turned around to get my clothes and just run for it. But when I turned around... I slipped on a patch of grass and hit my back against the rock that I showered on. I felt lightheaded, but okay, so 
I got up, gathered my things, and sped walk back to the camp. The next morning, as we were packing to leave, I hadn't told anybody about what I had seen or experienced that night. My back didn't have any bruises, and I had no scrapes or anything, so I honestly thought that it was just a dream. Until my girlfriend told me that I woke her up a bit when I got back in bed last night. I still didn't tell anybody what I saw, though. But before we left, I told my girlfriend that I had left a sock near the shower area. I told her that I must have dropped it on the way back or something and that I needed to go and get it. I went back to the shower and I looked at the tree, but there was no moss at all there. Just a completely brown bark. Not even a speck of green, just some grey parts on the tree. I literally said out loud, wow, as I just sort of stared at it. And that's pretty much it. I went home and nothing crazy has ever happened since then. No weird experiences or encounters, just plain old normal life. So early April of last year, my roommate left me alone in the house for a week while he was off house-sitting for his family. We're not in a great area too, but it's well populated, and our neighbours are fantastic, so I'm not too concerned, and am looking forward to having some peace and quiet for once. But just a bit after 7.30pm, I'm upstairs, sitting in my jammies, fully immersed in playing a game, when I hear a knock at the door. Not expecting anyone, I looked out my window overlooking the porch and see a strange older couple standing there. Now, my grandmother's late husband seemed to think that providing my name and address to his church and repeatedly sending missionaries to my door to talk about Jesus was going to get me to join them on Sundays instead of sleeping in and being a lesbian. So, when I didn't recognize them from the neighborhood, I just assumed that they were some of the parishioners here to give me yet another Bible. Annoyed, I just pause my game and I head downstairs to do the usual. Thanks, but super duper happy smooching ladies. Bye. Song and dance and open the door and notice that the guy is holding a clipboard. Odd, I thought. We do get the occasional energy efficiency or home alarm salespeople, but it was a bit late for that. I give them a sort of mildly irritated yes and... The guy introduces them as members from the International Family Federation for World Peace and Unification. That focuses on family, apparently. The name didn't really register, and he spoke in a sort of slow, even tone that was so distracting and unnatural it made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. He immediately reminded me, for some reason, of Marshall Applewhite, and I thought how unfortunate that was for him. But he asks me if I think my family is important, I'm wanting him to get to the point, donations, fundraising, whatever it might be, so they can get the heck off of my porch, I say, sure, I guess, or well, something to that nature. And then he tells me that they're conducting a survey and asks if I would be interested in sitting down for a few minutes with them. The clipboard was facing outward and he took so long to speak that I was able to glance down and see that the first question was about marital status. And my radar went up. First of all, there was no way in heck that I'm going to tell some random stranger at my door that I'm not married. I'm not about to let them in to view how alone I currently am in this evening. That aside though, I was just getting super creepy vibes from them. The woman hadn't said a single word yet and was just staring at me the whole time. I told them that I'm really not interested and... I just shut the door. I still had that little nagging feeling though that something just wasn't right so I watched them leave. And they didn't stop at any of the other houses. Which didn't make sense to me if they were in fact doing a survey when we have a ton of neighbours and we're kind of in the middle of, well, everyone. But instead they just got in their car and they left. I, uh... Immediately whipped open Google to look up their organization before I forgot the name. The International Family Federation for World Peace and Unification. Quite a mouthful, right? But it was formerly known as the Unification Church, which is what I knew it as. And it's an internationally known cult that specializes in mass arranged weddings and crazy stuff like that. They had apparently rebranded and were apparently there recruiting at my house. 
at 7.30 at night? The first day that I'm home by myself for a week? Something tells me that that just isn't a coincidence. Needless to say though, I spent the rest of the week with the curtains down, researching large dog breeds and anxiously waiting for my roommate to get home. 